but let's start again. Ramon Bueller, Paul Summers, thank you for joining me. And, um, you know, I was so excited to talk to you guys about this Keep Nine uh, initiative that you guys are doing. And uh, first of all, you know, um, I just want to give the floor to you guys to introduce yourself. Roman's the head of this Keep Nine Coalition. And Paul, you're one of the coaches, I believe, and also uh, the former uh, AG of Tennessee. So um, give, give the audience a little bit of your background and um, the floor is yours. Paul is the chair. He's my they, boss. Uh, I was, the, I've been, I've been very, very fortunate. I've had several jobs, particularly in the state of Tennessee, also in the federal government. I won't bore you with all the details, but I've been an elected district attorney general, an appellate court judge, a senior judge, and also the attorney general for the state of Tennessee. I've also been in private practice and I've practiced law on the courthouse square in my hometown in West Tennessee. And I practice in a big tall building law firm a regional firm in Nashville. About two years ago, the chair of the coalition to preserve the independence of the Supreme Court, Andy Miller, a colleague of mine, called me on the phone. And he told me that he was actively involved as the chairman and also actively involved almost on a day-to-day -day basis with the Keep Nine Coalition. He said, this is something, Paul, that I know you well. Now, Andy is an, an old line Democrat. I'm a conservative and uh, I've come from West Tennessee, a democratic country, but uh, I no longer am a Democrat. I'm, I call myself a conservative. But Andy told me that this was something that he thought I might be interested in and he told me generally what the Keep Nine Coalition was about. And he also advised me that there were 15 former attorneys general with whom he had met, half of whom, actually more than half of whom were Democrats. The other half or so were Republicans who were really promoting the Keep Nine Amendment, which turns out to be a 13 word amendment. that basically says that the Supreme Court of the United States shall be composed of nine justices. And I told Andy, I said, a lot of people don't even know, including Paul Summers, that you had to pass a statute to change the number on the Supreme Court. And he said, that's correct. You, all you have to do is to pass a statute signed by the president. And we feel like that this would promote court packing, which basically is uh, increasing the number or theoretically decreasing the number of the members of the Supreme Court so that the court would do more of what Congress wants them to do. This is called court packing. And I said, well, that wouldn't be good, Andy. He said, Paul, I'm going to send you some materials. He did. I studied them. I called Andy and I told him that I would be more than happy to be involved. He told me about Ramon Bueller, who is a veritable expert when it comes to politics and policy and the governmental operations. And uh, he introduced me to him. And then Andy died about three months ago. Maybe it's going on four months ago. God bless his heart. And, and now I'm the chair of the coalition to preserve the independence of the Supreme Court. We're truly a grassroots organization. We are against court packing. We are completely bipartisan and we are going to promote and are promoting what now has become the most popular constitutional amendment regarding the Supreme Court that, uh, that has been proposed in the last two, three, four years. And Ramon can tell you some of the statistics on that. But the bottom line is this, thank you so much for your attention to this. Court packing is something that we are trying to prevent. We've had nine justices on the Supreme Court for the last 152 years. The system has worked very well. We wanna keep it working very well. And independent judiciary is the crown jewel of our democratic republic that we have called 
the United States of America. Got it. Thanks. Uh, Roman, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, thanks for that, uh, Paul. Appreciate it. So, so uh, I, uh, I came to California in 1967 uh, to go to college uh, because uh, it was warm weather and uh, Beach Boys told me it was a great place to live. And um, I got involved in politics, uh, spent uh, 20 years in uh, mostly grassroots politics here in, in California, starting with the, uh, the college and uh, young Republicans and then in the state Republican Party. And, and uh, I was doing uh, uh, managing campaigns and doing political work. And along, along the way, I got a law degree. Um, and uh, then in 1989, I got a call from uh, the office of Newt Gingrich who was then a, uh, a relatively junior member of Congress who'd just taken over a committee. And he asked me to come to Washington as the senior Republican uh, committee lawyer dealing with uh, election integrity and election fraud issues. And I spent 14 years, uh, originally hired by Newt, but 14 years uh, as the senior Republican lawyer for the uh, Republican uh, conference in the, in the House of Representatives. I was the uh, they call me the, the counsel to the Committee on House Administration, which was the committee that dealt with election law. So I watched uh, over the years uh, as uh, uh, various efforts were launched to nationalize election law, which I thought was a very bad idea. Um, and uh, I learned a lot about uh, how, uh, uh, you know, what some of the big government progressives are trying to do in Washington. And uh, so when I finished uh, at the House of Representatives, I worked for a number of years as a lobbyist, um, but I ended up becoming very concerned about the balance of state and federal power. And uh, uh, several years ago, uh, put together a team of people who focused mm -hmm. on that issue. And two years ago, two and a half years ago, I met Andy Miller who was very interested in the court packing issue. And we began to work together. And uh, with his help, as Paul has mentioned, we put together um, a team of uh, uh, attorney, former state attorneys general. Uh, we were able to get some attention to this issue. And then last fall, we uh, uh, were able to find a Democratic member of Congress, uh, Colin Peterson, who was then the chairman of the Agriculture Committee uh, for the Democratic majority in the House. And he introduced uh, the amendment in the House. And then we were very fortunate to uh, have uh, Senator Ted Cruz introduce the amendment in the Senate. So we had bipartisan support, a Democratic lead in the House and a Republican lead in the Senate. And then uh, starting in January, as interest began to increase in uh, court packing and in the threat of court packing, uh, our, our support has accelerated. We now have more than 200 members of Congress uh, who've endorsed uh, uh, the uh, Keep Nine Amendment. We have 800 state legislators around the country, more than 800 state legislators. Uh, we've had resolutions uh, passed in 19 state legislative chambers urging Congress to propose the amendment. We have a growing number of governors and lieutenant governors and, and uh, state attorneys general who support the amendment. Our, uh, our kind of top legal uh, advisor is Ed Meese, Reagan's former attorney general. Uh, and we think that just as grassroots movements were able to help uh, uh, persuade Congress to propose in the states to ratify the uh, amendments like the one for women's right to vote and amendments uh, to limit presidential terms, we think that this amendment, uh, driven by a, a grassroots movement of citizens, uh, can actually persuade Congress to act. And the most exciting news is that we just had a poll done by uh, McLaughlin and Associates uh, which when you ask voters, would you support a constitutional amendment that says the Supreme Court of the United States is nine justices, an astounding 64% without any other explanation say yes, uh, and only 27% say no. And what's even more astounding is that when you break that down and you ask Democrats, just self-identified Democrats, would you support such an amendment? 51% of Democrats said they would support an amendment, only 27 uh, said no. So the numbers are 64, I'm sorry, I might've misspoken, 64 yes, 17 no overall. 
and 51 to 27 among Democrats. And what that shows is that while support for packing the court uh, may be endemic among big government established uh, Democrats in Washington, it is not an issue that grassroots Democrats around the country or grassroots voters of any party uh, support. Most people believe that the Supreme Court ought to be independent. It ought not to be controlled by politicians. I agree with that. Um, so now you're saying um, 200 members of Congress are now supporting this amendment. So yes. um, do you need, you, you're, you're basically close to the finish line is what I'm hearing. Oh no. What's because the, what are the next steps to get this? So a constitutional amendment Go ahead. requires two thirds of the House Needs two and thirds. the Senate. So it's yeah. gonna take 290 members of uh, the House and it's going to take 67 members of the Senate. And what that means is that we're gonna to have to have pretty much the united support of Republicans. And we're gonna to have to have roughly a third of the Democrats in order to get this done. And so a lot of people say, well, how in the heck are you gonna get a third of the Democrats to support something when many of them are so upset that uh, there are too many uh, uh, judges appointed by Republicans on the court. I don't wanna say Republican judges because when a judge is appointed, they become a judge. They're not party one way party or the other. Um, and I think judges on both sides uh, uh, of the political spectrum, of the ideological spectrum agree that one of the things that make them different from politicians is they are there to interpret the law, not to make the law. Uh, they have different ways of describing that. Uh, but the, the question is, how do we get, uh, how do we build the strongest possible bipartisan support for this? And I think the answer is very, very simple. When politicians discover that if they don't support an amendment that is overwhelmingly backed by voters, when they discover that not supporting that amendment risks losing an election, and some of them actually lose elections because they don't support an amendment. Politicians are there to represent their constituents and they wanna get elected. And they want a majority of people from their party to be elected. And when people discover that this is an, an amendment that they can't ignore, we will end up um, with this amendment in the constitution. There are a lot of people who said women will never get the right to vote. There are a lot of people said they'll never enact prohibition. A lot of people have said they'll never repeal prohibition. A lot of people have said they'll never, never get presidential term limits. And there are even people that said they'll never get an 18 year old vote. But all of those amendments in recent memory happened because overwhelming majorities of voters decided that they wanted the amendment. And there was a strong enough grassroots movement mm -hmm. out there, grassroots and community movement that made the issue central. And so this may take a little while, but we think in the end it will happen. And frankly, if it doesn't happen, the, the, uh, the results for, for the future of the American Republic and for the future of American democracy are catastrophic because you can't have a republic, you can't have a democracy if people don't respect the rule of law. And if they think politicians, uh, judges are just puppets of politicians, uh, we won't have the respect for rule of law that we need uh, for this democracy and this republic to thrive. I think your message is very strong. And um, are you seeing that that's uh, working on the ground that you're convincing more and more people to and community groups to join and make some noise? Because I think what you really have to fight is a lot of the Democratic uh, senators, especially that are politicking <laughs> and uh, will not be uh, receptive to this, even if their constituents are pushing them. So what is the... Um, have, have we made tangible progress, especially when it comes to the senators? Because uh, you need, what, 17 Democrats there to peel off? I mean, we can have uh, Manchin and Cinema, and a few of them will, will probably support this. But then as you move further to the left, uh, you're going to have to peel off a lot more Democrats that are not as open to being centrist or moderate. How are you going to accomplish that? So... Here's, here's, our, here's what we've done and here's what we haven't done. The first thing is, I gotta, we gotta say, we haven't broken uh, 
the Iron Triangle in Washington yet. They're still the Democratic establishment is still still telling uh, Democratic incumbents don't support this amendment. Now, we think that's because eventually they want to pack the court. So mm -hmm. uh, the stronger their it's resistance, <laughs> the stronger our argument for doing it. But at the grassroots, we've had some extraordinary success. Um, and, you know, I grew up in a time when public opinion was led by young people. It was young people who led the civil rights movement in the late 50s and 60s. And whether I agree with them or not, it was young people who led the movement um, that ended the Vietnam War. And um, it's young people that have led so many of the reform movements, uh, whether you like them or not, uh, that have changed American culture. Mm -hmm. And what we found is that on both sides of the political spectrum, there are increasing numbers of young people who believe in an independent Supreme Court. So you can certainly understand how this uh, 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 issue would appeal to conservatives. And we've got people from the Young Americans for Freedom and from the College Republicans and from Turning Point. And we've got a growing network of grassroots conservatives who are pushing this because they understand that if um, any party uh, gets absolute power, control of Congress, control of the White House, control of the courts, uh, that that's almost the classic uh, doorway to tyranny. And so they're opposed to it. But what's really- All surprising... the groups you cited though are sure. conservative groups. Right. How about We're progressive about groups? So what's really exciting is there is a new group and you can look them up online. It's called Progressives for Keep Nine. And this is a group of young people that we've found through the networks that we have who are almost all Bernie Sanders progressives. They are people who wouldn't agree with the Republicans on any issue. Um, a completely different set of priorities. But on one thing they agree, and that is that the Supreme Court ought not to be a puppet of politicians. And you know, Bernie Sanders himself in the presidential debate said, I'm not for packing the court because I'm afraid Republicans will do it. And, you know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who is no conservative, said, look, nine is a good number. I'm opposed to court packing. And even Joe Biden, in the beginning, before he had to compromise with some of the other forces in his party, said, I wouldn't get into court packing. One party adds four judges, three judges. The other party adds three judges and the courts lose all respect. So there's a very powerful group of... It, Powerful quotes and oh, you don't have to look very far, far back. Tony Blinken, Joe Biden's secretary of state, just gave a speech in Ecuador not very long ago, a couple, two or three weeks ago, where he said democracy is under threat. And one of the ways that would be authoritarians undermine democracy is by packing the court. Now, this is Biden's own secretary of state denouncing court packing because it undermines democracy. So there's a very strong intellectual case on the left side of the political spectrum that court packing is bad. But what, what encourages us that we've got this group of this growing group of young people, progressives for Keep Nine, who are as active in supporting the Keep Nine Amendment as the conservatives are. And so we think that as this movement grows okay. from the grassroots, um, we're gonna see more and more candidates reflect this. So, for example, in California, there's a gentleman by the name of Rishi Kumar. He is a former member of the Democratic Executive Committee and then State Democratic Party Executive in California. He got 40 percent of the vote running in, in the California top two primary last time. He is running again uh, for Congress. And he is a, an out front Keep Nine supporter. And if you go to Progressives for Keep Nine, you can see his op-ed on that website. Um, uh, there is a, a, a Kansan Chu, who is a former Democratic assemblyman, who was probably, uh, who is also running again, I believe, for the state legislature this year, is another Democrat. And these are Democrats <coughs> who understand their reasoning is completely different from Republican. They also want an independent Supreme Court but they recognize that the priority for Democrats in 2022 and 2024 
It's not some pie in the sky scheme for you know restructuring uh, the American Republic. Their priority is winning elections. And smart Democrats understand that they got shellacked in 2020 in key Senate races for two reasons. One, Biden said you wouldn't tell voters where he stood. And so that shone the spotlight on all the Democratic Senate candidates. And then Republicans said Democrats are either explicitly for packing the court or won't denounce it. And Democrats lost a whole bunch of races, including their opportunity to decisively control the Senate in 2020. So Democrats understand that court packing is a poison issue. What we have to do and what Democrats haven't quite learned yet, there are some Democrats who think that saying they're opposed to court packing is enough. And so if you wonder where the, the we want to win wing of the Democratic Party is, um, ask uh, the Democratic senators in New Hampshire or in Nevada uh, or in Arizona where they stand on court packing. And they will all tell you they're opposed to court packing. Maggie Hassan says she's opposed to court packing. And uh, Catherine Cortez Masto in Nevada says she's opposed to court packing. And, and uh, Mark Kelly, who's up for re-election next year, he says, I'm opposed to court packing. What they haven't figured out is that when they're in a debate and their Republican opponent says, oh, you're opposed to court packing, well, will you join me in supporting this amendment which would permanently ban it? If they won't support an amendment to ban court packing, swing voters are gonna wonder whether they're being lied to when someone says, well, I'm against court packing, but I don't really wanna ban it, which in English means, I don't wanna ban it today. I don't wanna pack the court today, but tomorrow I might want to ban, I might want to pack the court, so I don't want to ban it. And I, we think what's going to happen is this, this grassroots movement, including candidates, for example, like Rishi Kumar and Kansan Chu, as they begin to, to spread the message that Democrats who want to win should support a ban on court packing, we're going to get more and more Democrats doing that. And it may take a while um, for Democrats to, to learn their lesson. But we think because bipartisan support for this is strong, so strong among voters, and we mm -hmm. have such a broad-based group of advocates, including all of these uh, former state attorneys general, both Democrats and Republicans, that eventually uh, the candidates and the incumbents, they may be the last to learn, but they will learn. Uh, and I mm -hmm. think down the road, we're going to get this amendment done, but it's going to take an enormous amount of work, not going to be easy. Great, thank you, Roman, for explaining that. I want to go back to Paul. Um, you know, as a former, I, I was very impressed with your resume. Um, you know, being a judge and also, you know, um, an AG. Uh, what are your personal reason reasonings for getting behind this? And um, you were also a former Democrat, so I kind of want to hear about. You know, maybe um, I, I know we wanted to get um, your other co-chair who was a Democrat, but he couldn't make it today. So maybe you can speak a little to kind of where he's coming from, from the other side of the political spectrum and why he would, uh, you know, support this. Back in 1789, when our forefathers approved the Constitution, when it was ratified, our, for, our founders not only were smart men, but they were also clairvoyant. They could look into the future. They intentionally created three separate and equal branches of government. Mm -hmm. Two were 105% political, the executive branch and the legislative branch. They were political. The third branch was intentionally created non-political because the third branch needed to be independent. Mm -hmm. it, it, it was separate and independent. Now, of course, it's become somewhat political in the confirmation process, but truly, as Ramon said earlier, judges, when they get on the bench, they don't follow, they don't follow policy. They don't follow politics. They're not supposed to. They're supposed to follow the Constitution and interpret the Constitution as to what those words mean. Now, what's going to happen if uh, we've got a crown, I keep, I keep calling it a crown jewel because it is, 
a crown jewel in an independent judiciary. We've had an independent judiciary. We've had nine justices on the Supreme Court since 1869. We've had a minimum of, we've had a low number of five. We've had a high number of 10. It was reduced to nine in 1869 after the Civil War. It's been, it's been nine for 152 years. Now, as Ramon said earlier, not only is it a political issue for some parties and for some people, but it, but it, also, uh, is, it also is a career ending issue if it's not handled in the proper way. Now, there's no question that, that, that there are some people who may on, on the first question, are you for or are you against court packing? They, they go say, well, I'm against court packing. Well, if they don't answer the second question, regarding the keep nine constitutional amendment in what we consider to be the proper way, then they are quite frankly wishy-washy and they're just not telling us the truth because what they're saying, as Ramon said, is what they're saying is we're not for court packing today, but we might want to reserve it for tomorrow. Now, what's going to happen? Let's suppose, hypothetically, let's suppose that one party is in power, uh, just like the, the Democrats uh, control the Congress, the Democratic Democrats control the executive branch. All they would have to do today would be to pass a law that says the Supreme Court shall consist of six more people. And they pass that law, it becomes law. Court, uh, the constitutional amendment, the keep nine amendment is a firewall against that political activity it's a firewall uh, you you would have to you would have to change the constitution to change it if we pass the constitutional amendment called keep nine now what happens in about 10 12 years when later when the other party say the republicans hypothetically are in complete control they not only control the house and the senate but also control the presidency what are they going to do more likely than not they will retaliate and they will add another six members to the Supreme Court. And then they will appoint members that they want, they, they feel like would promote the activities and the laws that they pass. So now 35 years from now, when some child on Thanksgiving day comes up to his or her granddaddy and says, granddaddy, why do we have 31 members on the US Supreme Court? That's what we don't want to happen. We don't want judges to be politicians in black <laughs> robes. We want judges to interpret the constitution as it says. And <clears throat> true, true, it takes it takes. But Paul, I feel that's already happening. I feel I'm that sorry? already um, a lot of people are perceiving the judges to be activist judges. I can certainly see Sotomayor or Kagan being kind of activists in some of the you know, rulings. And uh, I think progressives also look at some of the conservative judges and say and call them activist judges as well. So, I mean, look at what happened to Brett Kavanaugh. Well, so well, um, can you speak to that? Sure. It has, it has become, it has not only come political, but it, almost to the point of being acerbic when it comes to the appointment process, particularly speaking about Kavanaugh. But let's look at Kavanaugh. Kavanaugh went through what he went through. Uh, why he went through it, I have no idea, but he did. And he was confirmed. Now, what, what, has, what has been his, what, what has Kavanaugh done to to uh, uh, label him uh, uh, an activist since he's been on the Supreme Court? Answer that question for me. I think certainly all the political circus that went and uh, around him maybe pushed him a little to the right. I mean, the, the left can argue that, and I think we've seen it in some of the rulings. So, well, they, they, you know, they it's can, subtle, they can argue but it's- that, but they have, they have, They've been arguing the, part, the party that doesn't like the decision has been arguing political action and political activity for the last 230 something years since we've had a Supreme Court. There is not a case, Fair. I've argued before the Supreme Court. 
There is not a case that gets before the Supreme Court that is not controversial. And the loser is going to say, well, you've got political activists on it. Well, is, is, is changing that temporarily by packing the court going to remedy that? No. What's no, it's not. Is we'll I think that's your best argument. We'll, we'll yeah. wind, wind up being like a banana republic, like yes. some of these other banana republics that we see around us, where we've got 31 members on the Supreme mm -hmm. Court who are nothing more than people who are politicians in black robes. That's, we don't want that. Now, you have to be a judge. You have to you have to rule on the what the Constitution says or what you you feel like it says. You have to rule not on policy or on politics. But let me also say this: not only does a Supreme Court or any court, for that matter, need to be independent, but it also follows the rule of law. We've all heard about the rule of law. The rule of law is in the Declaration of Independence. That is that every well, man and woman. The due process is being thrown out the window these days, especially with what happened with the Rittenhouse case. I mean, we saw that go down where he was basically uh, had guilty before an, even a trial by the public. But so what that's we had, kind of my worry. Uh, well, that's my worry too. But what what we what we're trying to do is we're trying to promote the rule of law. But most importantly, not only are we trying to promote the rule of law and due process, but the Supreme Court the federal judiciary, and the judiciary at the state level. They act as checks and balances mm -hmm. on abuse of power by the other branches of government, whether these are acts or whether they are actions of the other branch of government. If, if you don't have a, an independent judiciary, then you don't have checks and balances on abuse mm -hmm. of power, and we'll wind up being in an, an authoritarian authoritarian state and a tyrannical state. That's, that's I certainly that's can appreciate that ideal. I think the reality is uh, our society is becoming more and more emotional and less, um, you know, uh, less open to, um, you know, some of these logical arguments, which I want to bring it back to Roman, because you had said something really uh, poignant, which is that these young people are getting involved and uh you know especially on the progressive side um and i just want to push back on that because i feel like uh i'm seeing a lot of young people that are uh number one uh you know if they're if they're you know passionate they're extreme about it and then the uh, the others are the completely complacent ones that don't even know how civics works so how are we going to address that and get, you know, and you had said that, yes, it's young people that start the movements like against the Vietnam War, all of this stuff. I agree with you. I think the young people are obviously our future, <laughs> but, you know, I am scared to give them the keys right now because most of my peers, I'm a millennial, most of my peers, I would not trust to run a lemonade stand. So, Roman, how do we address this and get them to listen to these very great logical arguments you laid out about Keep Nine when a lot of them are cheerleading for the Democrat team like it's a sports team and they're willing to throw out due process, they're willing to throw out all traditions um, to, to accomplish a win for their side? So I agree with you that in the end, you need a mix of logic and emotion to move any voter. I think one of the things that we have to educate people about is the difference, and Paul was talking about this, between an ideological uh, preference of a judge, and judges have ideological preferences, and, a, and political obedience. If you are in the House of Representatives, and Nancy Pelosi says, this is how I want you to vote. She's got a whole bunch of levers to make you vote that way. If you are in the Senate and Mitch McConnell is saying to a Republican, this is how I want you to vote. There's political pressure that can be applied to those folks. And what's different about judges is that they, once they are on the bench and they are appointed for life, they are immune from political pressure. They cannot be replaced. And unless 
the, the, the form of pressure that right now the left is trying to apply is to say, if you don't do what exactly what we want with, you know, what we want as partisans, we will put partisan judges on the court that will do what you want. And there's some Democrats, and this is where you get to the emotion, that understand that if we had a tradition in America of packing the court and a future president like Trump came along who decided that they wanted to change the rules in the middle of the game, that they could pack the court. And one of the things I hear from these kids is imagine if Donald Trump, who <laughs> wanted to stay president forever, right, had been able to pack the Supreme Court with his partisans. What kind of a democracy would he have them? And that, I think there are two emotional arguments that resonate with young people. They have grown up, they grew up, a lot of them, just as, as Republicans were very sensitive to what they believe was the abuse of power by Obama and what they see as the abuse of power by Biden. A lot of Democrats saw what they perceived as the abuse of power by Trump and it terrifies them. And every time they see a poll that shows like the recent ones that Trump would defeat Joe Biden in an election if the election were held today and that in, in five key states, Trump beats Biden. Mm -hmm. By I'm double digits in Michigan. <laughs> they're thinking, oh my God, if the next president like Trump Mm -hmm. could pack the Supreme Court, we could lose our democracy. And so what I've observed in politics is that when politicians have power, they don't want to give it up. So there are a bunch of politicians in Washington that have a lot of power, including the power to manipulate the court. They don't want to give it up. Mm -hmm. But voters, particularly these young voters, are terrified. And I think in the end, the two arguments that will persuade, persuade Democrats are, do you want Trump, a future president like Trump, to have the power to pack the court? And that resonates. They're terrified of that. And that's one of the reasons why when other progressives say, well, hey, they're conservatives on the court. Don't you want to replace them with liberals? They go, no, because we don't <laughs> want to give a future president Trump that power. Yeah. And the other emotional argument that these guys relate to. They have a set of agenda items that they want to do. They want to spend money in ways that help constituencies that they want to help. Now, um, I'm more conservative. I may not believe that um, shoveling money out the door is the right way to solve social problems. But there are plenty of people on the progressive side who believe that is the right way to solve problems. And what they are beginning to understand is that if the Democratic Party stands for a set of popular ideas to help old people and sick people and people without jobs and people with families, they stand for those popular ideas, but they also stand for corrupting the Supreme Court, that they will lose elections that they would otherwise win. Mm -hmm. And the Democrats actually have a choice. Um, do they focus on issues that help them win a majority? Or do mm -hmm. they focus on a broader set of issues that will allow Republicans to beat them more easily? And I think the combination mm -hmm. of fear of the abuse of power, if, if the court packing power is retained, and the fear that supporting for court packing will cost them the elections that they desperately want to win, I think the combination of those things will begin to appeal to more and more Democrats. And as you saw, as we saw in the civil rights movement, as we saw uh, with the women's right to vote, as we saw with the, the movement to end the Vietnam War, the politicians in Washington were the last group to get the message sure. that we won the battle um, among, uh, in, in the culture first, and then the politicians followed. We often think of politicians that. as leaders, but in our system on big issues, frequently they're followers. So I think we, we've already, we are, the polls show that the voters are with us. We have to build the activist core that does that. And I think in the end, those emotional arguments um, combined with the very, very good um, policy arguments mm -hmm. will eventually carry the day.
And um, mm -hmm. I, I think actually that the biggest question I have is um, will people on the conservative side of the spectrum who are right now distracted, right now, if you ask conservatives, what do they care about? Well, it's this trial or it's immigration or it's uh, abortion or it's gay marriage or it's critical race theory in the schools or some other cultural issue. And I think the left is very happy to distract conservatives with cultural issues where you can run around and make a lot of money on the internet and you can have get great headlines. But in the end, we could win every one of those battles. And if one party or the other party ends up packing the court, we will lose our democracy. We will lose our right. constitutional republic. And mm -hmm. if the question is, can advocates of limited government, of limited constitutional government, wherever they are on the spectrum, and whatever their pet issue happens to be, can they realize that this issue defines everything. I'm gonna give you an example. There are probably a lot of voters that you talk to who have very strong views about China and about Taiwan and about Hong Kong. Now, you think about it. What do the leaders in Beijing want most? They want an America that will retreat from international commitments that will undermine our own ability to defend ourselves and that will keep our economy totally dependent on the whims of crony capitalists mm -hmm. and bureaucrats in China. Those are their goals. Weak America, an America dependent and lack of defense. What is the one thing that would almost guarantee that kind of leadership in America for a generation. And that the is judicial, the left, if the left uh, were able to pack the court and rig the mm -hmm. rules so they won an election. Right. Mm -hmm. So if I were talking to someone who says, my number one goal is to preserve democracy and expand democracy in East Asia, I would say, then you should make sure that one of your priorities is making sure that the pro court packing left can't pack the Supreme Court. And so Orange County where you live is a hotbed of people who understand the dangers of leftist tyranny because a lot of them and their families have experienced it personally. But they've and forgotten just, now. <laughs> well, some of them have forgotten, but some of them remember. And we have to find the ones that remember. Yes. And a handful, 10 people, who are like Paul and me and others around the country in Orange County who said, you know, if we are going to save American democracy, we have to save the independent. If we can mobilize our activists, mm -hmm. we will find others, right? There are, I'm sure, tens of thousands of Democrats in Southern California who would join this effort, but there are probably not as many of them who would become leaders. And so our goal is to mm -hmm. find some people who would, who would like to become leaders, who understand that this is the Gettysburg, mm -hmm. if you will, of the modern American cultural civil war. And that if we win this battle, that American democracy is safe. But if we lose this battle, mm -hmm. um, we may lose the war. So Roman and Paul, uh, sorry, we're up to the end of the hour now, but I think you've made a very compelling case about how important this is. But let's wrap up with some action items. What can people do to get involved and to help out? Um, what's the uh, um, tangible to-do list for people that want to get involved and become the leaders that you just mentioned? So if there's one thing that I would ask a listener of this program to do, it is to send us an email and say, I'd like to become more involved. And you send it to leaders at keep nine, spelled it out, N-I-N-E, leaders at keep nine.org. Send us an email at leaders at keep nine.org. If you want to learn more about the effort and see the list of supporters, 
you can go to www.keepnine.org. But the most important thing, send us an email at leaders at keepnine.org. I'm going to be in Orange County speaking to uh, uh, at least one group over the next in the next few weeks. And I'd love to meet with people in Orange County who would like to become more involved in this because Orange County is one of the places which will decide whether or not the current majority stays in power or whether a new majority takes over. And if this issue becomes prominent in Orange County, I guarantee you it will have national impact. Paul. Mark, Mark thank you so much. I, there's one thing that I would like for those, uh, particularly the millennials to do, and that is go back and look in history at 1937. FDR was in power. The Democrats were in power overwhelmingly. FDR tried to, tried to pack the court, the last attempt. He failed miserably. His opponents were emboldened. His allies were dismayed. That's the last time it's been tried. It doesn't work. It doesn't work politically. And it certainly undermines the Democratic, public, Democratic Republic and the crown jewel of an independent judiciary. We don't want that in the United States of America. Amen to that. So Paul Summers, Roman, Roman Bueller, uh, thank you so much for your time today. And Roman, call me please when you're um, in Orange County. I'd love to meet up with you and, and help you with this. I think it's a great initiative. So uh, keep up the great work. And when there are any milestones, like um, such as if you get you know a majority in the house or two thirds rather, um, I'd love to reconnect with you guys and talk about the progress of this uh, initiative here. So uh, don't be shy to reach out. Thank you again for your time today. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mark. Um, are we off?